everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple for the past decade now, and I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. Um, they predominantly work with the plant medicine ayahuasca, working in a lineage of a group of people called the Shipibo people. And um, they run 12-day retreats, uh, six ceremonies, which is a, a really intensive process. Uh, working with four different Shipibo healers, doctors, cordanderos, two to three facilitators. They offer yoga, a chance to work with herbalists, bone doctors, massage therapists. They have an amazing uh, integration team. So all in all, it's just a really amazing uh, space that's been created to go really deeply into this work and to work with it uh, in, in a very, I think, traditional way, uh, combining traditional techniques with a lot of uh, a lot of other very beneficial practices and uh, to, to really allow people to go really deep into this work. So if you'd like more information on the temple, uh, they're scheduled to reopen next month in, in August of, uh, of this year. Um, unfortunately, they've been closed since uh, since the pandemic started, but they are scheduled to reopen. So to find out more information about the temple, you can check out their website at templethewayoflight.org. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And then also my friend and colleague, Marav Artsy, and I are continuing to run diets. We finished our last diet here in New York, in the United States, and we're returning to Peru, to the Sacred Valley, where we're continuing to run diets in September. Um, if you'd like more information about that, you can check out our websites. My website is nicotianarustica.org and hers is uh, tobaccodiets.com. And that's a really amazing opportunity to go, uh, I think, really deeply into this world of plant medicine, uh, to really experience firsthand the, the experiential power of these plants, of a process called dieting, going into isolation, um, and really restricting one's intake and, and going really deeply into the, the, the healing benefits, the, the, the mental psychological benefits, and the spiritual benefits of, of what this plant medicine can really do. So I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. My guest today uh, is my friend Alex Eklund. Uh, we met a number of years ago when I was practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu here in New York City. Um, we had the, the same teacher, a gentleman named Vitor Shaolin Hiberto. Um, and Alex became a good friend, also a, a teacher, uh, a, a world champion jiu-jitsu practitioner. And I, I've always had a lot of respect for, for Alex. I think he carries himself in a really humble way, really dedicated himself to that art. And, uh, and so we really got into to martial arts, to jiu-jitsu. Uh, he also uh, was very moved by a, a book that was very dear to me, The Tao Te Ching. So we just talked a lot about martial arts, about um, about Taoism, and and also uh, in a way how these things also mix with plant work. So it was a really good conversation. And uh, even if you're not interested in martial arts, I, I think you'll find this uh, this podcast really interesting. So I hope you enjoy it. As always, if you're able to support the channel, um, that's a really big help. <clears throat> Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service. For as little as a dollar a month, you can subscribe. There's different tiers you can sign up for, uh, and it gives you some really nice things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As, and, and that's a really big help to support me to continue to, to make these podcasts and, and bring on these guests. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate all of your support. Um, there's also the uh, th there's also an option now via YouTube <clears throat> to join the, the channel and get a lot of those same benefits. So there should be a little join button uh, below on this video um, and then there's also the option to donate directly via PayPal so I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes um, so I think that's it uh, also if you're not able to do that um, subscribing to the show is a really big help so for the YouTube channel subscribing turning on the notification bell liking the video it's a small thing but that really helps with the algorithms and getting the show out to a bigger audience and then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts uh, I think it's following now the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review. That's a really big help. So I think that's enough for me. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Alex. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. 
running out from the ladies today I'm running out from the maids Running out from the maids Running out of the maids today Cool man, any, any questions or... Are you ready to rock? Get into it? Yeah. Alright. Well yeah, welcome. We met... Was it now? Ten years ago? Maybe more. Maybe more. I think it was the end of 2009. I came to, to Shaolin's. And, uh... Yeah, some more. Ten or eleven years. Now, ten or eleven years, yeah. Yeah, I joke in Peru because I started doing jiu-jitsu again that, that I'm now the, the, the world's longest purple belt. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got that in 2012. I'm still a purple belt in 2021. It's been it's been some time, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, man, maybe. Uh, so I met you in Shaolin's, which is a jiu-jitsu studio, yeah. and I I've been interested in martial arts for a really long time. I think it was like very much a part of my path about being really interested in, in religion and spirituality yeah. and eventually natural medicine. And uh, for me, like martial arts was always something very phys uh, spiritual, like not just physical, which yeah. is even interesting because like sometimes being in Peru or working in this, this field, there's, there's an interesting like prejudice against martial arts. It's like often seen as like violent or mm -hmm. aggressive or somehow out of alignment with like a higher purpose. And I was actually talking to my buddy, uh, James, <clears throat> uh, I'm staying with him and He's training now at, uh, at Enzo Gracie's. Mm -hmm. And really interesting guy. He's a boxer, a yoga guy. He's the guy I went out with last night and had a few <laughs> too many drinks with him. Uh, but he was saying for him, like, jiu-jitsu was actually even more spiritual than yoga. Like, there was something for him that, that like, he just feels really connected. And, you know, I, I really understand what he's talking about. Like, there's, there's, and I think we can get more into it, but there, there's, like, a, transcendental quality sometimes for sure it. so yeah so anyway for my path i mean i was really interested in i started with like softer martial arts because i was really you know we also talked a little bit about taoism from time to time mm -hmm. and that always had a really big impact on me because it was this idea of like you know which i think is a fundamental principle of jiu-jitsu but like leverage like using someone's weight their strength their momentum not against them in a way, but against like transmuting that you sure. know, to, to our benefit. And I always really liked that idea, even philosophically. So I, I started with things like judo and tai chi and aikido because that's they really seem to, to focus on that. But then I really noticed that like something was missing. Like like I didn't know what it was to be like punched in the face or like you know, <laughs> kneed in the chest or like kicked in the leg. Like there was, I felt like that was missing. Like. Like I felt like in order to really embody those qualities that they were talking about, those ideals, which did seem very beautiful to me, like I had to also understand like the opposite of that, like, you know, the, 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 the baseness, the aggression, the, 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 like really what it felt like to be in bad positions. And so that's when I started uh, Muay Thai. Mm. And then uh, that was amazing. But then also I reached a point where I'm like, I, I don't know if I can keep doing this. <laughs> My body, my body will only hold up for so long, and then, and then I, I found jujitsu, and jujitsu just seemed to be like this beautiful harmony of like of so many things. So that's where we met. So maybe, maybe just to start a little bit about your background, like I, I know you're a you're a you're a New Yorker, a Brooklyn guy. So who is Alex, and and how did how did that path eventually lead to, yeah. to jujitsu? Um, so I came to America when I was six years old from Ukraine. And um, like Russian, Ukrainian, like Eastern European parents, like they think, you know, judo, sambo, martial arts, like all kids should do, should do it. And um, <clears throat> when I was young, uh, one of my favorite movies that my dad had me watch was Bloodsport. Oh, yeah. You know, so <laughs> I saw Bloodsport. I saw Jean-Claude Van Damme doing a split. <laughs> and, you know, I must have been maybe 10, maybe 9, 10 years old. And I said, that's what I want to do. Um, the difference between Jean Claude Van Damme and myself was that I had a you know a belly from eating McDonald's and Chinese food, um, but that didn't stop me. So you know I begged my parents and we found the karate school, 
And um, someone actually interesting told me that he started as a ballet dancer. Uh, Jean Claude. Yeah. Yeah. So he's actually not even a trained martial artist, from what I understand. He's actually more of a dancer. He's more into you know into, into that's uh, into that than karate or kickboxing. And then, but you know he's so athletic, he was able to implement all of that um, into his training. Um, so I did a little bit of karate and then um, stopped. You know, I was doing like other stuff. And uh, then my parents put me into a judo camp, and I really loved it. Um, I had like I remember one of my you know first experiences was um, doing a tournament and just like shaking and puking right before the match, you know. But then afterwards, um, you know, I competed and like for me it was you know such a memorable experience. Like that was just like uh, one of my earliest fondest memories, you know, like doing that. Um, but after about a year or two, I think I quit. And, you know, then I started, you know, get the, why, why do you think that happened? I think it happened because um, I don't think I was very good. Um, and, like, uh, like my parents were putting me into other things. So I was trying, like, you know, ping pong. I was trying tennis. I was trying, you know, different sports. Just trying, I guess, trying to find something that I was, quote, unquote, uh, good at. And um, I wasn't really good at any of those things. And the, the, what drew me the most, what I was personally interested in the most, uh, over judo, over all those physical things, was art. So the, the thing that I would ask my parents to, to do the most would be like to find you know, places that I can draw, places that I could paint, and you know, tr uh, you know, trying to uh, grow in, in that respect. Um, and through that, I got into graffiti. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with, graf uh, with graffiti. And you know, as a teenager, I was like running around you know, spray painting and stuff like that. And getting into this some was trouble, all legal, right? huh? All legally, of course. You know, <laughs> so everything was legal. I was commissioned, you know, by the city of New York uh, to, you know, to do some some artwork, and uh, it's still up today. Some of it, all right, wow. uh, unless it's you know buffed out. <laughs> um, so I did that for you know for a few years. So that was really my passion, um, like that. And actually, um, I joke, but it's actually the truth. My only regret in my whole life is that I was not in a wrestling uh, club in high school. So my wrestling, I was in FDR High School in Brooklyn. They had a really, really strong wrestling program. Uh, at the time that I was there, it was one of the strongest in, the, in all of New York City. And I, I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing this stuff, you know. And I was in the art club and I was doing graffiti and, you know, that, that was kind of the route that I took. Um, that's literally my only regret. Um, I wish I was in that wrestling club. And then um, I got into some trouble. And afterwards, I decided to like stop, you know, doing the graffiti, stop doing, uh, you know, running around, doing this kind of nonsense. And I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to return to, uh, to martial arts again. And actually, during that time period, I had a big injury. I uh, fractured my lower back, so I had a L1 and L2 compression fracture in my back. And um, during this time, I lost a lot of my friends. So because I was home for about six months. I didn't really go outside much and I didn't, I wasn't able to communicate. Like, it's not like today where, you know, you're on the iPhone all day on Instagram. You know, back then I was the AOL on some messenger. And um, I uh, started to go on this forum, bodybuilding.com. And I developed a pen pal friend. And he also kind of encouraged me to, like, do martial arts again. We would talk about UFC. And then I found the jujitsu school next to my house and uh, I ran off with it. My very first class after that, I think I did pretty much did have done it every single day unless I've had an injury unless I was like you know unable to do it for whatever reason but almost every single day since then I've done it how old were you uh, I was 17 17 yeah. and what do you think it was that, that drew you to, to jiu-jitsu because like so like you, you think it was just a at that age you were ready or there was something specifically about jiu-jitsu like that you didn't see in, in karate or judo I think I was, you know, at 17, I was more mature to accept it. And, um, like, karate was my choice to do. Um, but it was also, like, you know, I was kind of scattered when I was a kid. You know, I wanted to do this, 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 and this. And, you know, when I was 17, I didn't have that many hobbies. I didn't have that, that many things to do. I had no purpose. Um, I wasn't really doing that well academically. I didn't have, like, a dream to be anything, really. Um, but when I found jujitsu. Like, my first class, like, I thought it was going to be way easier than it was. Um, so, the school that I started at, it was on a, it was a storefront. It was a ground floor. And I remember during my first class, I, in the middle of the class, I had to run out and I had to throw up on the sidewalk because I was too embarrassed to throw up in their bathroom or something like that. So, I threw up and I was like, oh, my God, this is like, 
you know, unbelievably difficult, but in a good way, not in a way that uh, I would want to, you know, abandon it or not come back. And I little by little came back and just, you know, fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And that was a, that was a school in Brooklyn. It was a school in Brooklyn, yeah. Mm-hmm. So how would you how would you describe jujitsu if if someone has never? I think a lot of people have heard of it now, but yeah. maybe just peripherally, like they're not they know it's a martial art, but like sometimes people will be like, "Is that kaipoera? Is that where you dance?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean jujitsu. I mean, uh, what's the translation for jujitsu? It's the gentle art. Right, uh, but uh, I have a, a bit of a dry sense of humor. It's definitely, it's definitely not the gentle art. You know, that's definitely a little bit of a misinformation. Uh, it can be gentle, but most of the time it's not. Um, jiu-jitsu, it's uh, a grappling-based martial art where the goal is to find a way to use leverage uh, to quote-unquote beat your opponent or submit them. And um, the way to do that is by using the ground as your friend. So you're taking the person to the ground, and then once on the ground, you're able to use gravity, leverage, and your whole body weight to attack one of their limbs or their neck to make them give up. And it's a way to win a fight without throwing a single punch or a single strike. And are you familiar with the history of, because usually jiu-jitsu is is referred to Brazilian jiu-jitsu or BJJ. Are you familiar with like that story of of like why, why Brazil? Sure. Like how did it? How did it get there? Why? Like, what, what is the Brazilian influence? Um, so Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a derivative of judo, and uh, this uh, judo is a derivative of Japanese jiu-jitsu. So judo is the sport version of Japanese jiu-jitsu, and um, in judo there are uh, quite a bit of rules, and the rules are quite strict. So it's a lot of oftentimes under the referee's discretion when to stand the fight up. So if you and I are you know, doing some groundwork in the Vaza, if we're fighting on the floor and there's not too much action, then a lot of times we're going to get stood up. So we don't have a significant amount of time to work. So uh, judo players end up being really, really quick submission artists and really quick you know, guard passers and, or you know, working to reverse really quickly because they don't have that much time to work. Um, so what happened was a judo master visited Brazil and he taught uh, the Gracie family and uh, some other uh, uh, Brazilian uh, people. Uh, and th- what they said is, like, why don't we spend more time and focus on the groundwork more so without any limitations? And they really uh, worked to develop that. And it was, uh, you know, quite a bit of people. And um, uh, the Gracie family is credited to, you know, kind of refining the, the ground aspect of judo, which turned into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And, and was that... Was that because they saw the the like like a lot of a lot of Japanese martial arts? Like it seems like even things like Aikido, there's often like these these very like looping motions, and you know I've heard like that came from like samurai times. It's like you know how do you stop someone if they're like swinging a sword at you? So mm-hmm. like these kind of motions, these very like sw- swooping, flowing motions, and. Um, do you think that was like the, the ground aspect, especially with the Gracie family, was because they were interested in like the practical use and, and they saw that a lot of fights ended up on the ground, like almost always they start standing and then and then they end up on the ground, so really focusing on that rather than the, the stand-up? Um, I think it's c- connected, right? Because like in judo, a lot of times you, uh, you can win with a nippon. So nippon means you throw somebody and their shoulder blades touch the mat. But oftentimes, even after you do an ipon, even if the person's shoulder blades touch the mat, a lot of times th- there's so much force on that takedown that the person that's doing the takedown has actually ends up on the bottom. However, uh, in judo, the match stops when that happens. So it doesn't even matter that the person that won ends up in an in, uh, inferior position. Uh, whereas in jiu-jitsu, like the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the goal is the submission, right? And the submission, it's very black and white. There's a clear winner and a clear loser. Um, because the you know one person had to give up, had to say mate, same as in blood sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think once you put a little bit of thought, you know, from a, a fighting aspect and a, from a very practical aspect, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, made a lot of sense. Um, later, what happened was uh, you know everything becomes a full circle. Um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the sport aspect of it, from a fight, you know, from a fighting standpoint, doesn't make that much sense because. Um, the emphasis on takedowns, which are prevalent in judo, are are not really needed as much. 
Um, so there's, you know, later on it developed into some, you know, it's straight away from the fighting aspect. But in the very beginning, I think it, it uh, the heart of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was the, the fighting spirit. Um, and one of my judo coaches, his name is Sensei Shina. Um, he is a nine degree uh, red and uh, white belt, and he's one of a handful, one maybe I think one of only two red and white belts in all of the USA. And he's you know one of the leading authorities on, on judo in America. Uh, now he's retired, but he ran a judo club, uh, Japan uh, Judo and Karate in on Bay Parkway in Brooklyn for many years. And one time I took a seminar with him, and um, it was a judo for BJJ seminar. And he gave a lot of respect to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And what he said was very interesting. He said, like, you know, the samurai spirit is, you know, to kill somebody. And he said that he really respected Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, because it's almost like you're killing the other person, right? Like, the person is tapping out before that happens, but if they had not tapped out, you had a chance to kill them. So he felt like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu really embodied a fighting spirit. Um, so it was a very interesting way and uh, you know, it was very interesting to hear him give this kind of respect to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as a, you know, such an old school and such an authority from Judo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Judo, Judo, I mean, even when I was younger, I was fascinated by it because it, it, it's very powerful, like the, the, the throws, like there, there's a lot of force. I mean, there's a lot of beauty, a lot of technique, but there's a tremendous amount of like power behind, like when you really oh, throw yeah. someone, it's... But it was interesting because I was just watching the Olympics the other day, and I think it was two two women competing, and 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 she won by a throw. I, I've forgotten all mm -hmm. the names now, but uh, I mean, she landed essentially giving her back to this other woman. Yeah, the match was over, and it having done jujitsu, it just it, it was a bit shocking because it was like she won, but that was a really bad throw in a practical sense yes yeah. <laughs> she was in a, a horrible position and it wasn't just she, she like she gave her back because she knew it was over it was like the the way the mechanics of that throw the only yeah. outcome was exposing her back at the end sure sure yeah i think um you know once uh every sport has this issue right like once there's a set of rules and people find the easiest route to win based on the rules that they're given and a lot of times the practicality has to be replaced with just winning and then result being just winning and um, every single martial art uh, has these issues in one way or another right like uh, in boxing um, you can't kick you know so a lot of, or you can't knee so a lot of boxers end up you know bending over to deflect punches where they would be open to a knee to the head um, taekwondo obviously the rules are you know you can't punch the head so their hands are down um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the issue is that takedowns are usually only rewarded two points, and usually there are no penalties to pull guard. So a lot of people, including myself, we just pull guard, which in a practical sense is completely unrealistic. Um, so, you know, every single martial art has has these kind of issues, and some more than others. Um, unfortunately, Judo, you know, in the past few years, they developed more rules to try to differentiate themselves from, from wrestling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, uh, single legs and double legs are no, no, no longer allowed in Judo. Mm -hmm. So you cannot grab uh, for the legs. And mm -hmm. fireman carries, the Katsugaruma, which was, you know, a lot of ju uh, Judoka's, like, favorite takedown, uh, is not allowed. Um, so it kind of, you know, some practicality was lost during, you know, during this rule change as well. Mm -hmm. What have you seen in the evolution of jiu-jitsu? Because, I mean, even I remember when I started, um, I mean, it was, I guess it was more formal in the sense that it was, it was mainly gi, uh, gi jiu-jitsu. There, there wasn't as much no gi jiu-jitsu. Like, that's one thing that's really seemed to shift. I, I mean, I don't know how it is now, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if gi jiu-jitsu is, is more common, or no gi jiu-jitsu is more common now than gi jiu-jitsu. Uh, like a real something I found very surprising when I started was was uh, because I was also interested in sambo and with jujitsu the real lack of emphasis on the legs I just thought yeah. was crazy like what you know and it was always this premise that it's it can be dangerous which I, I totally understand but again it seems like you're you're leaving out like this huge huge aspect of the game where because for me, the, the, the beauty of jiu-jitsu was like, it can be very practical, like it can be very real. But if you're leaving out half the thing, it's, it's like you were saying with boxing, like if you get in bad habits, like bending your head to mm -hmm. avoid a punch, like 
it, it loses its practicality in a way. Yeah. So, but that seems like something that's really evolved now with jiu-jitsu as people are focusing a lot more on the legs. And yep, yep, yep. And actually, the one of the main governing bodies of jiu-jitsu um, at the IBJJF, um, this, this year they just legalized uh, heel hooks for brown and black belts. Mm. So this was a huge step, you know, because many schools all over the world would just follow their rule set and they would train under their rule set and there was no good reason uh, for not allowing leg locks and heel hooks and other leg entanglements other than, oh, it's not allowed in the IBJJF. You know, but I always thought that didn't make much sense. And just because, uh, you know, a committee just sat down and said, these are the rules, you know, why should the whole world just follow what these, you know, this group of people said? Um, and especially because it didn't make that much sense. Um, leg locks are, you know, in my opinion, are no more dangerous than most other submissions. Um, they should be treated as every other submission from an offensive and defensive standpoint where students learn, you know, to do them correctly, to do them safely, and also learn how to escape them safely. Um, the only issue between leg locks and arm locks, for example, is, you know, if you, you know, pop your knee or your ankle, you know, now it's hard to walk, you know, maybe your quality of life decreases more so than if you popped your arm where it, it usually is not going to affect you that much. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense, I do agree. But other than that, you know, I think... You know, adding leg locks and, you know, working every single submission is, is what jiu-jitsu should be all about. And is the idea that at, at, at brown and black, there's just enough wherewithal to realize, like, if you're in a bad position, you, you should have the wherewithal to be able to tap out? Or is it lower belts, like, maybe people aren't used to it at that point? I don't know. I think even though even, even, you know, they made it legal for brown and black belts, I think even purple should be allowed as well. And um, I think there should be, you know, less restri restrictions altogether. And I remember maybe I was a purple or brown belt, and um, like Shalin, his school, he was also, you know, very strict with IBJJF rules, and you know, everybody trained with those rules. And one time I just asked him, you know, what his thoughts were on heel hooks and leg locks. And this was in a moment in time where they were kind of frowned upon, and you know, not allowed to, you know, to be done in training. And Shalin also told me, he's like, yeah, I think, you know, everything should be legal. If Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, if we are known as the, you know, the leading grappling art, then, you know, it's embarrassing if, you know, we don't know an aspect of grappling and, you know, the leg attacks being a huge one. So um, I think it's the steps in the right direction, but I would like to see even uh, more things be, you know, legalized, even for some of the lower uh, ranks as well. Do you think that's happening more in, in Nogi Jiu-Jitsu, just because often they don't tend to focus so much on, on belts? It, it seems to be a little more just kind of open in that way, where that there's not, often you, you don't even know what the belt is of yeah. the guy you're, you're facing. So. Yeah, um, definitely. So a lot of the leg entanglements are only allowed in, in, in Nogi. And I do agree with some of it because it's a lot of times it's hard enough to escape um, when there is no friction. So when there is friction, when the person can grab, a lot of, a lot of those leg attacks would be almost impossible to, to escape from. So um, I, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, but I agree with you. I think, you know, I, I like Nogi for that reason. You know, I have a funny story, actually. One time I was doing a seminar in California, and it was a Nogi seminar. And it was one of my first, like, Nogi seminars. And... Um, like one gentleman, he was asking like some very, very simple questions and, you know, just, you know, I stereotyped him and I looked at him and I was like, oh, he's probably a blue belt, you know, in my head. And then, I, you know, I started to roll with him after the rolling portion and I quickly realized he was a black belt, you know, and to me, that's the best, you know, I, I, I really enjoy that experience. And, you know, I know just like everybody else knows, you know, don't look at somebody and, you know, judge them and think, oh, this person must be this or that. But myself, like everybody else, we do it. And, you know, it's always good to kind of have that truth hit you in that face, you know, once in a while. And um, that's another reason I really like, you know, Nogi, because people, you know, they don't look at the other person's belt, how many stripes they have, you know, oh my God, this guy has a really, really torn up blue belt. He must be a blue belt for a long time. He must be X, Y, Z. You know, this is all unnecessary, you know. Um, I think when you're rolling, it's, it should be almost like a video game. You know, there's just like a level, you know, you see some arms, some legs and neck, and how can I use my arms, legs and my neck to attack theirs? As opposed to looking at, you know, their gi, their belt, you know, things like that. I mean, that is a fascinating thing. It, it, it's always something, I mean, I, I see it in myself. Like, you, you know, it, it's something I, I think <clears throat> in general in life I, I've become much better at because I put a, a focus on it, which is, you know, 
really trying to be the same in every situation, like adapting to the environment, but but seeing the humanity in everyone, you know, whether I'm talking to a homeless guy or the president, you know, and of course that's not always easy. Like there's always things that yeah. are going on inside, but uh, I think especially the older I get, maybe it's just being jaded in life and things don't impress me so much. But, you know, I think more is just because we don't know, you know, we, we, we never know. And we do tend to put all of these layers and, and often they tend to hold us back. But I've noticed in, in jujitsu, that's still there, yeah. you know, and it, it's, it's, <clears throat> and I've noticed even that even sometimes when I'm going with, with lower belts, you know, like, like for example, when I started training again in Peru, because I, I wasn't training for like seven years when I was in the jungle, and then I, I came up to the mountains and I started training again, I didn't have my gi or anything, so I was borrowing a gi, I didn't have my belt, so I was just using a white belt. And it, if people saw I had a white belt, they were a lot more aggressive, they were like, they're going for the, the kill, they're going for the win, yeah. they, they had confidence, like, oh, well, he's just a white belt. When I put on the purple belt, from the get-go, there was, there was more caution, yeah. But, but it's fascinating how that changes our, our mindset. Yep, you know, yep. Instead of like, this is my game, I'm going to implement it. It's, you know, and, and that, that almost starting from a place of action when, when we think we were better towards a place of hesitancy, almost automatically going on the defense. Sure. Yeah, and I feel it too. Like some people that I roll with, I feel them giving me too much respect. And I, 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 I can always tell, right? Uh, but at, on the flip side, I see, you know, because I'm a black belt, you know, some people, when they roll with me, they want to just take me out, too. So it's kind of like, you know, double-sided. But, you know, the best is, you know, if they don't, if they wouldn't know, and if it was just, uh, you know, they would roll with me like they would roll with anybody else. You know, just, it's their game against my game. And, you know, I think no gi facilitates that a little bit more than the gi. Um, like for me, like uh, it's gonna sound like cliche, but uh, like the, the the belts, I only care to get the black belt for two reasons. Uh, number one, so you know that my parents would stop asking me how that karate is going, you know, <laughs> and why I'm doing karate, you know, twice a day. Um, they're very supportive, but at the same time, they you know you know they're immigrants, and I'm an only child, so for them, you know, education was you know, jujitsu was not education for them. You know, I looked at it as education. I looked at it as something that one day I could you know do with you know as I'm doing right now. But, you know, they, they believed in me, but also at the same time they didn't. You know, I think they wanted, you know, me to take a more uh, standard approach, which, uh, you know, I completely understand. Um, so from that, from one aspect, it was for that. And, yeah, the second would be for business and for to teach. You know, unfortunately, you know, you know, you kind of need to be at a you know, higher rank for people to, you know, look you up, for people to visit your school and things like that. You know, but other than that, you know, I, I meet quite a few people that are, you know, very you know, interested, you know, uh, and, you know, all they think about is the belt and stuff like that. And I think, you know, they're kind of missing it. And um, I wish it was a little bit otherwise. And I think if we had no belt system at all, um, it would be a little bit cleaner. Um, in in some, uh, like, Russian martial arts, like Sambo and some others, there's, like, a, a title called Master of Sport. So from 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 what I uh, from what I know, like you know, it's basically your training, and then you know, once you get to a, a high level, you become a master of sport, and that's it, you know. And uh, like then you're recognized as a black belt, quote unquote. So I like things like that. I think uh, you know that would, you know put pressure off of a lot of people's shoulders, and they would focus more on the technique and actually improving as opposed to you know the belt and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I know that. So you, you you were you were and still do a lot of jujitsu, and then at one point you started doing Muay Thai and even a little bit of mixed martial arts. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about that? Like yeah. What, what drew you to that, or what you were looking for? Well, you know, my pen pal, his name is Zach. Uh, you know, him and I, we would always chat about UFC and MMA. And actually, I started jujitsu with the you know the thought to one day fight MMA. But uh, I quickly got sidetracked, you know, and I just fell in love with the sport, sport aspect of jiu-jitsu and I was only doing jiu-jitsu and I didn't do any wrestling, any boxing, any kickboxing. And, uh, you know, as I, I, you know, as I become, became, you know, more proficient in jiu-jitsu, I was still thinking that I'd still want to, you know, try MMA. And actually my goal was to fight uh, professionally in MMA. So what happened was, 
uh, one of Shawn's assistant coaches, Laurel, um, he had a Muay Thai coach named Charlie, and I got to meet Charlie, and Charlie is, uh, you know, he was my first Muay Thai coach, and we started training together, and um, learning Muay Thai was like, you know, it was like starting Jiu Jitsu for the first time. Um, it's like that fresh feeling, you know, that like new shirt feeling. And I, you know, really loved it. And then Charlie, um, he had a full-time job and he was only teaching like a few times a week. So he was like, hey man, if you want to do this like every day, then you have to go uh, to this 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 uh, guy named Koban in the city. And Koban is a living legend Muay Thai. And, you know, I started going to Koban's. And actually, when I started training Muay Thai, I fell in love with Muay Thai that, you know, MMA also took a backseat and I started fighting in Muay Thai. Um, and then eventually... Um, I got really, uh, you know, tired of working, you know, and it was, a, you know, New York City was, you know, very stressful. So I decided to just like, you know, get rid of all that and move to Thailand. And I went to Thailand and I trained there for a few months. And, you know, when after I came back, um, I did one MMA fight. And my goal was to get more, but, you know, life took a different turn. And I opened up the school and, you know, started doing more jujitsu again. And, you know, but I'm, you know, no regrets on any of that. But that, that's how that happened. What what would you say? I mean, obviously, there's there's a lot of form difference between something like Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. But do you do you find like what what Muay Thai gave you in a way that was different from Jiu Jitsu? Uh, well, first of all, Muay Thai, I think, as a singular martial art, is probably the most realistic and the strongest just as a purely practical singular martial art, you know, because Muay Thai has many aspects of grappling in it as well. Um, so that was something that I really appreciated. Um, I really appreciated the difficulty of it as well. And um, there's so many interesting, you know, like, nuances in Muay Thai that, you know, I, I, I really, you know, fell in love with um, just even how to train. Like, for example, when I was training with Shaolin, um, there was only one intensity. Um, it's pretty much you're going 100%, you know, every class and, you know, every single role that I ever had, you know, I was going full on. Uh, whereas in Muay Thai, you can't spar like that. You know, there are some training sessions when you can go pretty hard, but some training sessions, you don't even spar. You just, you know, you do pad work, you do bag work, you know, you work on your clinch. And when you do spar full on, a lot of times it's at a softer pace or it depends where you're going with. So, um, that's something that, that, that I really liked, you know, the difference in the training. Um, the other thing is I felt like Muay Thai helped me explain and teach Jiu Jitsu better uh, because my full time job when I was uh, teaching Muay Thai uh, when I was training Muay Thai was teaching Jiu Jitsu and I was able to explain Jiu Jitsu better and, and you know because uh, Muay Thai is less abstract than Jiu Jitsu a lot of times like you know you see two people on the floor just intertwined it's really hard to explain to somebody that doesn't really understand what's going on exactly what's happening but on the feed it's pretty easy to explain some strategies and you know even you know people that never trained before they can understand it so that's something else that i really appreciated from it and then what was it like uh with the mixed martial arts like kind of combining what you had been working on yeah you know I, mixed martial arts was the best because i realized that it's so much easier watching it on tv than actually doing it you know and uh, it was a, a rude awakening in many ways um, I remember just like drilling, you know, I was going to Long Island MMA and just drilling with some of the pro fighters, you know, just uh, these are just athletes on a different level. You know, the main difference between jiu-jitsu and MMA, and jiu-jitsu is slightly changing now actually too, but in jiu-jitsu you don't really have to be like a top athlete, you know, you can kind of get away with being unathletic and still win, still perform, but in MMA you cannot. In MMA you have to be, you know, an incredible athlete, you have to be very physical, and you have to be very technical. So, you know, that's another curveball that was really interesting in MMA. Um, but I'm very grateful that I had one, one fight. Um, I think that's one experience that I can, you know, live, you know, really live with for the rest of my life. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm okay with also the, the path that I've taken now as well. What was, uh, what did it feel like kind of combining all of those things? Did it, did it flow in a way that you thought or... I mean, because also I, I would imagine the first fight is it, it's it's quite a new experience. Like there's familiarity of, of all of the different things coming together, but to actually really do that, I would imagine it's quite, in a way, like overwhelming too. It's like, okay, okay, here I am. Like, yeah. Am I am I putting these things together? What's going on? Like. Yeah, I think uh, for myself, I was able to put it together because you know I had a. 
a pretty deep uh, grappling background when, uh, when I had my first MMA fight. I believe I was already a black belt when I had my first MMA fight. I think I just I had just gotten my black belt, and I was training Muay Thai for a couple of years. So you know, I had you know uh, decent knowledge on striking, um, and you know the wrestling and combining all of it in Long Island MMA uh, helped me put everything together. So um, I felt pretty comfortable, but uh, you know, getting hit with those small gloves, you know, in my fight, I remember you know. At one point, I got hit, and because of the adrenaline, you don't really feel pain. But I just feel I felt like somebody squirted a water bottle on my face as soon as I got hit, and I knew that that was my blood. And but it's not painful, but it's like you have this kind of like, you know, this is real kind of moment. Um, and uh, it's 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 probably one of the hardest things anybody could do. Um, so you know, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. So then what was that like uh, beginning to open up your own studio? Kind of happened, you know, by accident, really, you know, because I started teaching in Koban's uh, Muay Thai. I started, I started their grappling program and, you know, that kind of blew up, uh, meaning like, you know, we had only a few people and then we started getting the classes, you know, they, they became packed. And I had some issues in, in Koban's Muay Thai just with, the, you know, with, with the, on the managerial side, you know. Um, there were some rules being implemented that there were too many people in my classes and you know They were now preventing me from having more students join the classes and you know for me I was getting just paid uh, per hour So it didn't really matter to me how many students were in the class But you know I felt like it was on my obligation to make that classes the best that it could be and you know Having everybody join would be you know was one of those routes so when a lot of those like rules started to get implemented, you know, I had a sour taste in my mouth and, you know, I, I said to myself, maybe I, could, I should just do it on my own. And uh, at that moment, I was living with my parents. So I had this idea to do a 24-7 uh, uh, training center. So my idea was to find a place that I could live in and I, could, I would just put a mat and I would have students come there and they could come whenever they want to and I would sometimes teach classes and there would be like a bartering system. I had all these crazy thoughts which I still have some of them today and I'm still looking to implement some of them. Um, and that's what I was searching for. And um, uh, my friend, the Ivor, uh, who you know very well as well, um, he was uh, you know, thinking about doing a coffee shop and he lives in Bushwick. And I was only in Bushwick a few times just to you know, go to his birthday party and things like that. And just accidentally we stumbled upon this like uh, dance studio um, that he, uh, he, he was looking to make a coffee shop upstairs of that dance studio. And I wasn't able to afford it on my own. And he and he were to help me out. He was like, "Hey, man, like we can do it 50-50 and you know I'll teach uh, kids and you teach adults." And Ivor was a black belt also at that point, so you know that's how we started. And then it just uh, it took off. And uh, you know I, it's 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 you know I'm still on that journey. You know I'm still in the beginning of that journey of you know running a school, you know building a team, building a brand, all of that. And it seemed to take off like quite quickly yeah because also the idea of it in the beginning that it was if i remember donation based yeah. but, but then people could do like monthly memberships yeah and so uh i mean i, I think that format because jiu-jitsu can be very expensive for people yeah yeah, yeah. i mean uh, i mean probably all over but especially in new york i mean the rents are very high yeah and, um, well if you remember you you know you told me two things you you gave me the Dao De Jing. And then you sent me off to the yoga class, <laughs> and you told me, Alex, stand in front of that class and you know do you know do the best you can. So I started to go to yoga to the people on your recommendation, um, and uh, the donation-based model really, you know, resonated with me because uh, I wasn't wealthy and I was like you know a kid, you know, in college and out of college, and I didn't have have that much money. So having that option to you know pay what I can really helped me out. And uh, I was thinking, man, we, maybe this could work in jujitsu one day. And, you know, due to Ivor's help with, you know, him, you know, splitting the cost of the space with me, this, the space wasn't that expensive. Uh, plus, I didn't want to, like, do a lot of the managerial work myself. You know, plus, I wanted to give back to everybody, you know, that couldn't afford jujitsu. Um, I decided to just put a box in there, and I was like, all right, you know, if you can, you know, pay, then pay. And, um, you know, I was, I was able to stay afloat, you know, from day one. And uh, I think it was like an accidental marketing uh, experiment. You know, I, when I first opened the school, people would come up to me and they would be like, hey, man, so how are you doing that free jiu-jitsu? And how are you able to, you know, just teach jiu-jitsu? And many people had misconceptions of me. Um, some people thought I was very wealthy and I just, you know, just decided to like do something like this. And, you know, that wasn't the case. Um, and it also wasn't free jiu-jitsu. 
Um, it could have been free, like many people uh, attended without paying, you know, and that's fine. Um, but uh, others that were able to financially afford it, you know, were able to, you know, keep the school afloat and I was able to pay myself. So it was able to be a win-win-win for everybody. And then uh, you opened up, uh, or you were going to open up a... Uh two or multiple locations and yeah we had two so we opened up a second one and uh you know we were really taking off so uh shortly after uh ivor had to leave you know uh, he had different things he was going to do and i brought van on board and uh, van and i you know we started you know hustling we, we got a team of instructors and uh, we opened up a second spot in downtown brooklyn and uh, that was right before covid and then when COVID hit, we had to close down both. And currently, we're in the process of reopening. And when we reopen, it's going to be just one. You know, but we have many plans to have different affiliates. And we have some really, really exciting ideas that we want to present to the jiu-jitsu world that I think don't exist yet. And I think can be very beneficial on many aspects and in, in how to learn, how to teach, you know, how you know, jiu-jitsu should, you know, can be run, you know, and, and the way it's run now in most places works right and uh you know with different monthly you know contracts etc but you know we have some ideas to make it you know uh a little bit uh more convenient and accessible for, you know to everybody anything you can share it's still it, it's still some under- of it some of it's proprietary you know some of it is top secret you know so you have to okay. subscribe to my newsletter you know to, to find out uh but now uh you know we're still going to keep some of the donation based options uh, we'll do our best to work with people, you know, that, uh, you know, can't afford, um, you know, to pay and stuff like that, you know, finding fair ways to, you know, for everybody to, to be able to win. Um, but more so, we, we just have a, a lot of ideas on how to make the, the student experience uh, better. And um, we have, you know, qu- quite a bit. So, um, like, first of all, like uh, what we talked about intensities previously, right? So most judicial schools just have like one level of intensity and some actually, you know, train at a, at a lower intensity and they're only allowed to train at a lower intensity and some, you know, they only train at a high intensity. So, you know, one thing that, for example, uh, we were doing um, right before the closure and this is one thing that we're going to implement in the upcoming school in different classes is, uh, is separating the mat and having different levels of intensity based on where you are. You know, so if you're a competitor, you know, uh, you would be in what I call the hot sauce section. So one uh, one section of the mat is you can go as hard as you can. Everything is legal. It's for the competitors. It's for people that are looking to go 100%. You know, it's, you know, it's like the left lane on the highway. You know, you're going as fast as you can. Then the middle section is the, the mild section where it's spicy, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's uh, not too spicy. You're not going to burn your tongue. So that intensity is going to be anywhere from like 60 to 80%. So that's for, you know, people that want to get a good sweat, want to get a good training, but don't want to, you know, they're not competitors, they're not looking to go, you know, too hard, um, or you're looking to sharpen up some some new skills. You know, oftentimes in the hot sauce section, it's very hard to sharpen new skills because you're only going at one pace. Uh, you can't sightsee. You have to keep your eyes on the road. Whereas when you're in the middle lane, you can look around a little bit, you know, you can see your surroundings a little bit more. And the third section is the ketchup section. You know, it's not spicy at all, and you can use as much of it as you can. You know, as a kid, I still love ketchup, and I still do, actually. Um, and that section is for people that want to drill, you know, they want to flow roll, they want to, you know, just practice, and uh, you don't even have to roll that hard. And if you do roll, like, it's it's very slow, very controlled. Um, so, like, we, this is one big idea and uh, something that, you know, we, we can have our affiliates use, and, you know, this is just one of many th- uh, concepts we're going to start to utilize. Do you think there there are like best practices with jujitsu, or it, it, that's kind of the idea of having these three different zones? Because it, it's really just so personal on the individual, on, on what they're looking for, uh, the mentality of the school, whether it's for competition, whether it's for practical purposes, or do you find there are like certain principles that that you found to be like very effective in in, in teaching or or practicing yourself? Well, I mean, almost every school, they, you know, they say that, you know, we're, you know, we're for everybody, everybody can come in. And however, you know, every school has its particular vibe and its particular like style or what they're known for. And uh, it's, it's, it's not true, right? So not every school is for everybody, right? Um, So like, this is one of the avenues that we are trying to, to use to make, you know, anybody welcome in the school, right? So somebody that's maybe a little bit older and has many injuries, you know, they can't grow 100%. 
you know, so they would be in the catch-up section for a while. Um, but it's also dishonest not to have this person roll, not to have this person go live, right? But, you know, for them to go, you know, with somebody that's, you know, 20 years old and Division Two wrestler and looking, you know, to compete in Naga, you know, it's maybe not the best idea, you know, so this would be one avenue. Um, you know, another big thing that, you know, uh, we're developing is, you know, curriculums, you know, so uh, there's not just a move of the day, you know, so uh, I don't believe in the omakase experience in jiu-jitsu. The omakase is when the chef, you know, hands you uh, the food and you, you have to accept whatever the chef gives you. You know, I believe in uh, ordering, right? And I believe uh, not only ordering, I believe in catering to your specific, specific diet. You know, so like, for example, if somebody walks into the restaurant, I may have the best burger, but maybe the person is a vegetarian, you know, so I should give them a vegetarian option. Uh, what I mean is maybe somebody that comes into the class, you know, the particular techniques that I'm teaching and the style that I'm teaching maybe not be as suitable for them. And they should have, they should be taught a style that's more suitable for them. Um, and if they're learning techniques that are not suitable for them, you know, it's good. There's a lot of value to it, but it's also a lot of time wasted. And they could excel and get better quicker and, you know, uh, expand on their own path if they have a more uh, generalized curriculum. So working on curriculum for, you know, different personalities, different body types, um, you know, whether you're tall or short or whether you're a counter player, whether you're aggressive, you know, all of these things are taken into account. And we, uh, you know, modify this curriculum based on the individual and based on who's in the class. Hmm. And, and how does that look like? It's different teachers would specialize in different things or it's like, like that you would group similar people together to teach those those specific things um you can do that we have you know there's different ways to achieve that like for example one way it's uh you can think of you know uh, like a junction right so you can think of a, a train a train a train station right so let's say we're on you know broadway lafayette you know there's the f there's the m you can walk a little bit there's the you know nqr so and they all take you on different routes but the meeting point is the same so for example let's say we're teaching an escape uh, from the bottom of mount and you end up in the half guard, right? So it's a prerequisite for everybody to learn to escape from the bottom mount in a similar fashion, right? Um, and once they escape and now they're in half guard, um, we would teach different routes depending on the uh, player, right? So one route would be maybe a, a, a wrestling uh, reversal from the bottom of half guard. Another route would be to stand up and, you know, go for a takedown of your own. Now, another route would be to go for a leg attack. Another route would be more specific to dive in and go to, you know, deep half guard, for example. So, and having people pick what they want to learn after, after they get to this junction, so to speak. It seems like, I mean, even from when I started, I mean, there, there was jujitsu and, and there was a, a decent number amount of people who practice it, but it seems like in the last 10 years or so, it's really exploded. Uh, to where now it's very mainstream. Almost everyone's heard of like the UFC, or um, and it seems like there's a lot more interest. Like people really like they like or even love practicing. Like it, it, it's like it's fulfilling something that was lacking in their lives. Do you have you seen that? And do you have any like thoughts on why it seems to to really be spreading so so quickly? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. You know, jujitsu. It's one of the only martial arts in the world that you can rest in, right? So um, because of that, you know, you can be 60 years old and you can start jiu-jitsu. Like, you know, one gentleman that you and I know very well is Tom Corey. Um, he started jiu-jitsu in his mid-60s, you know, and he was able to become a world champion in jiu-jitsu, you know, when he was uh, 70. Um, and that's not, you know, not really applicable for almost any other martial art, you know. It's really, really difficult to do that. Um, so that's one aspect. Like pretty much, you know, anybody can, can start jiu-jitsu. And um, the other thing is, I think the, the intimacy of jiu-jitsu is what draws a lot of people t to it. Just the uh, simple fact that you're on top of one another and you're so close and you're grappling, sweating on one another, that, that intimacy uh, bonds people. And, you know, you can't help but be friends with the guy or girl that, you, you know, was just trying to choke you on top of you for three minutes and you're making your life miserable. So I think that's a huge aspect. Um, the last and the big difference between, you know, jiu-jitsu and, like, let's say Muay Thai is um, in jiu-jitsu, you know, it's a, a much easier, um, or not easier, how should I say it? It's, it's much clearer to, to, to see the humility aspect. 
um, like in Muay Thai, like some of the people I trained with, like um, they were kind of, you know, not really good. But in their heads, they were really good and they were never tapped out, right? They were never like humbled uh, because in Muay Thai, you're training light. So in their head, you know, them getting, you know, touched on the face, they're like, oh, I would never, I would never have gotten knocked out when if they actually fought, they would. But in jiu-jitsu, even in the training room, you know, you see that, that submission and you know, you know, what happened, you know, very clearly. So that honesty aspect, I think, is what really draws a lot of people to it as well. And when you can top somebody out, you know, that's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a feeling like no other. And the next minute you're going to be tapped out too. So you kind of, you have this high and then you kind of get, you know, humbled as well at the same time. So I think that's also what draws a lot of people to it and makes them more humble and, you know, in my opinion, helps a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned Tom Corey and, and uh, where he has a, a Facebook jiu-jitsu group, jiu-jitsu over 40. I think 50 plus. 50 plus, yeah. yeah. But um, I don't go on Facebook that often, but sometimes that, that feed pops up. And um, But you're not 50, though, Jason. How are you, how are you in there? Well, how are you in there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually the administrator. You know, you're, okay, you're, you're okay. sitting with the administrator of that group. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 50, but I'm, uh, I'm Tom Corey. is a social media advisor, so okay. he had me, he had me help, help out of that group. Yeah. Well, I guess I look older than I am. <laughs> he threw me in there. <laughs> well, I still don't know how old you are. You know, I've asked you, I've asked you many times, and it's always a mistake. <laughs> but it, it's really beautiful, because sometimes I'll see these, these photos of, of, you know, these guys or ladies who post these pictures and it's like you know i got my second stripe on my white belt today or i got my blue belt today and and they often say something like you know it's it's one of the if not the the proudest moment of my life yeah and you know these these are these are like people who've had a lot of life experience i mean you know 50 plus like they're, yeah. they're not they're not kids it's not like necessarily something like a novel life experience like they, they they've gone through life and yet somehow this thing like this symbolic gesture of like receiving a new belt is extremely profound for them and you can see it just in the way they post you know the words and there is a lot of humility and respect and um do you think there's something that that just in the world we live in like we don't have those things like we don't have those initiation rights or we're not tested in that way because as you said, like with jujitsu, like you are tested. Like it's it's a very different thing, even like for Muay Thai. Like if you're not fighting, as you're saying, just sparring and kind of flowing, versus like having a gorilla on you, sweating, <laughs> like you know, trying to to literally choke you out or break your arm or break your leg. There's something very real in that, which, which as you said, was very intimate. And, and I think that's kind of strange for people to think about, but I think there is something to that. Like there's this intimacy that that's very primal exactly and and you know in so much of our society i mean especially now in the pandemic you know like social distancing but but even before that in normal life it's like we always have space around us there's a uh, you know there's not that intimacy i mean hopefully in our private relationships but that's you know a very small aspect Mm -hmm. of our lives and um but also just that 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 and I think it exists obviously much more for men, but but some women very strongly too, and to some degree in women. But that you know, as you said, there there's something when you tap someone out that that feels very satisfying. I mean, mm-hmm. it's almost like that inner that inner warrior that that victor comes yeah. out, and yet it's beautiful because you don't actually hurt the person. Exactly. Yeah, I think um, you know. As society develops more and more, you know, we're, sh- you know, straying away from nature. We're straying away from, you know, the, the animalistic uh, aspect of what we are, right? Like, it's not natural for us to be on our phone all day. You know, it's not natural for us not to socialize with people. And it's not natural for us just to be, in, you know, in a closed in a room. And jujitsu is one of the most animalistic things that you can do, right? Like wrestling, fighting with somebody else. And I think that brings us back to our roots, you know, to, you know, brings us back to nature. Um, So I think that's, you know, a huge, huge aspect of it. And I think also with the development of of a lot of technology, you know, and making it easier to communicate with people, I think actually that made people lonelier, right? Because like almost everybody says like, oh, 
you know, I would rather speak face to face and I would rather meet up face to face. But, you know, it's happening a lot of times rarer because you can just email the person or you can text them or you can FaceTime them. And, you know, that, that physical connection, when it gets taken away, in my opinion, you know, again, makes people lonelier. And jujitsu is the best thing not to be lonely, right? You have somebody on your back choking you, right? And the camaraderie that you build from your team and from your classmates and for, with your teacher and others, you know, it's just something that is, is not repli uh, replicable, you know. It's, you can only find it in, in something as primal and as animalistic as jujitsu or, you know, other martial arts. Why do you think that intimacy is created? Because I think a lot of, I mean, if people have practiced, they, they, I think they understand what you're saying, but if people haven't, that sounds very strange, like someone's trying to choke you out or, you know, essentially kill you, but not really. But, but how, like, how is that intimate? It seems like for a lot of people, that's like the, the most terrifying thing. They would want to distance themselves. Like, I, I don't yeah. want to be a part of that. Well, it's kind of like, uh, let's say, uh, I'm not sure what the term is, but the person that's uh, jumping out of an airplane with you, right? The person that, like, let's say it's your first time jumping out of a plane, and the person that's on your back, um, they're the ones that, you know, do the parachute, right? Um, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know. And, you know, it's, you know, that in itself, like, I've never jumped out of an airplane, and I'm scared of heights, and I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but I can imagine, even though I haven't done it, I can imagine that, the person that's on my back with the parachute, I would develop a, a bond with this person. It would be an intimate moment of us jumping out of this airplane together because literally our life is in their hands, right? And on a lesser scale, um, this exists in jiu-jitsu. Um, we have an unspoken agreement that when I tap out that you're going to let go of whatever you're holding on. So, and this is a two-way street. So this, this, this bond that's created between two practitioners that are training together I think is what makes it intimate. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting because uh, I, I think a lot of people, you know, you mentioned this idea that, that wrestling or grappling is very natural, which I completely agree with. But I think a lot of people would say, no, it's not. Like there's, like that's something maybe that society conditions upon us, like to be aggressive, to, to want to fight, like, you know, humans in a natural Edenistic, I don't know if that's a word, like, like a state like of Eden. Yeah. You know, this, this, everything is peaceful and beautiful and we're loving. And, um, and yet, you know, it's really fascinating, which is probably a, a, an experience a lot of people don't have more and more, especially in places like New York or the U.S. Like often when we have animals like dogs or cats we get them, them neutered or you know sterilized so they can't have babies but living in the jungle i came across this cat one time this this feral cat and she was crying and i didn't know what was wrong and so i, I was having a dilemma like should i give her food because i don't want her to become reliant on me like you know then like in a way i'm responsible for mm -hmm. what if she needs to go back out into the wild so I was having this like dilemma of what to do and, and finally I just decided, well, you know, like I'll give her some food. She seems distressed somehow. And, uh, but before I gave her the food, I, I was like, okay, I don't want to like keep her. I don't want to like cage her. Like she's a wild animal. I want to respect that. If she wants to stay, she can stay. If she doesn't, I don't want to like force mm -hmm. her in any way. So to give her the food, I like, I, because the walls of, of, of where I live are just like a mosquito netting because it's very hot. So. I cut like a little U-shaped cat door and I just like put the food on one side and she kind of got it and she walked through and then I'd go around, put the food on the other side. And so within five minutes, she realized how to use the, the door. I gave her food and then I was like, now it's her free will. Like she wants to stay, she can stay if she doesn't. So she stayed and then at night she went out and hunted and then came back the next day and then that's how it's been. And like, I felt really good about that in that way. It was like a kind of a mutual relationship then. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, I own her, she's mine. Um, but it, it was very interesting because I, I found out about two weeks after that she was pregnant. I started to, to notice. And um, and so eventually she had kittens. And it, it was a very, I mean, there was something very beautiful about it. I mean, very spiritual in a way. Like she was going into this like, really altered state of consciousness. I mean, she was like kind of between worlds in a way. I mean, 
just it was in, you know this life coming out and she had five kittens you know and wow. she just inherently knew what to do she would eat the placenta she started like relaxing and then kind of heaving again and going back into this altered state another one would come out and but it was fascinating so I, I raised these five kittens and uh, I mean really they only did three things they either nursed from her they slept and when they weren't doing those two things, they wrestled nonstop all the time. <laughs> That's all they did all day long. When they got tired, they'd pass out, then they'd go nurse, and then they'd wrestle. And they'd do that every single day, all day long. And I thought it was fascinating because, I mean, you know, they weren't seeing that for me. I wasn't wrestling anyone in my, my it's called the Tombow, my house. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't teaching them how to do it they were just doing it and you know eventually then they would start to like kind of test her they'd like wrestle with her a little and they'd like you know pull a little bit pull a little bit harder pull a little bit harder and then that was too hard she'd smack them then they they learned like oh, okay that's yeah i crossed the line and they'd back off and then they'd, they'd, they'd go to the other one, you know, like a smaller one, and put that technique <laughs> into play. But it was also fascinating because I also saw they were, they were doing jujitsu. And then I realized, like, we're actually, jujitsu is this primal thing. Like, yeah. it, you know, it wasn't they were mimicking man, it was man mimicking, yeah. mimicking animals. And, you know, like one would be on its back, it'd be playing bottom, and the other would be on the top, and like, controlling the neck and and then one would would reverse and one would go on the top and you know they, they'd use their 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 limbs to like push away and to escape and to get up and i mean it was fascinating it was like i was watching these like highly evolved jujitsu yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i guess my point of all of that was like that was inherent in them and you know it, it was it was seem a seemingly obvious thing but it really hit me like that that's inherent in life like that's yeah. what these things do they they eat they sleep and they they're they they have this physical dance and it, it it's also it seemed vitally important because it like it taught them respect it taught them rules it taught them like how to use their body like what what are boundaries and and it also very interesting something i i i found is i I didn't. I knew I needed to start giving some away to, to people who could take care of them properly, um, but I didn't want to do it too young because I wanted them to like have the proper milk and mm -hmm. you know to learn from the mother. And but one I ended up giving away a little bit earlier than I than I thought I should. But the the, the lady really wanted it, and I was like, okay. And interestingly, that one. How to put this? It's a little bit of an asshole, that cat. Wow. <laughs> it has almost this entitlement. It'll bite people. It doesn't really listen well. Yeah. All of the other ones I kept, and they're like these super nice. They never bite people. Uh, they're, they have this like interesting mix of softness, and yet they're murderers. Like, mm -hmm. like for real, they're murderers. Like they go out at night, and they kill. Mm-hmm. And again, that wasn't anything I taught them. I think it was something that the mother taught them. You know, even it was it was it was a little hard watching because like she would bring home a mouse, but she wouldn't kill it. She she maybe would like injure it a little bit, like so it couldn't run at full speed, and then she would just leave it. And these like kittens would start to go at it, but they didn't know how to kill it, and she wouldn't teach them how to kill it. She would just leave them. And they would slowly start to like figure it out. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit painful watching because you know this this poor mouse is like yeah. hours and hours like being tormented and slashed and them trying to figure out you know how to do it. But once they figured it once they figured it out, they became like these these amazing creatures you know who really embodied that those principles of what it what it is to be a cat. And so anyway, that was kind of a long rant. But but all of that going back to you know, it does seem like you're saying and, and that, that that aspect is like fundamental to life, you know, not just humans. And, you know, even in like, I think if we look at like young kids, you know, there's this inherent quality, especially young boys, you know, like to wrestle, mm -hmm. to, to be physical. Um, 
And it's a survival mechanism, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think every citizen of the world should have a right and should know how to defend themselves. And it starts by grappling. It starts by wrestling and it starts by being physical. And as you know, like uh, grappling, it's one of the things that looks easy, but it's one of the f hardest things that, that you can do. And that's the other thing that jujitsu teaches us, that humility aspect, right? So I've heard, you know, as, you know, especially over the last uh, year and a half, you know, many people saying that, you know, jujitsu, um, you know, doesn't really change anybody, right? That whoever the person was, you know, now, you know, let's say the person was a, you know, very negative person, you know, very dangerous person. Now, if you give them jujitsu, you're just giving a dangerous person jujitsu skills. And I, of course, there's there's a, you know a lot of truth to that, but I don't think it's an absolute truth. And I think the humility of being tapped out by somebody smaller than you, by somebody of a different gender than you, somebody that you would never expect to quote unquote lose to, um, is something that will help give that humility aspect and not to be like an asshole cat, right? And um, there are ways, right, that people get around that. Some people come to a training room and you know they only pick their training partners that that they can tap out etc so i'm not talking about that i'm talking about somebody that's uh, training jiu-jitsu in an honest way you know getting the full experience and you know one of my favorite quotes that i share you know all the time with my friends is uh that are there are two types of people in this world those that are humble and those that are about to be and jiu-jitsu is no better teacher than to teach you that and i think that's what kind of humbles us and you know makes us grounded in a way and uh, also, you know, now I know that that old, you know, grandma that's on, you know, walking on the sidewalk, she may be able to choke me, <laughs> you know, so I can't, you know, just, you know, bump her with my shoulder and, you know, shove her to the side so that, you know, I can get my Starbucks. You know, I have to respect her just like I respect everybody. And that's something that jujitsu taught me. And I think it taught, you know, the millions of others that have, you know, trained. Do you think that could be what the, the gentle art is alluding to? Well, you know, jujitsu, right? It's interesting. Like, uh, I, I took a seminar once with Hoyce Gracie, and he said uh, something that I think about till today. And I share what he said with a lot of my students, and you know, and a lot of the seminars that I do. He said that if your heartbeat is above seventy beats per minute, that you're not doing jujitsu. And you know, when I first heard it, I was like, man, what is he talking about? Like, so, like, what do you like? You know, and yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, right? And, you know, perfect jujitsu is maximum efficiency. Perfect jujitsu is I can beat you without my heartbeat, you know, going above 70. But perfect jujitsu is like world peace. Um, it's unattainable, right? Um, Hicks and Gracie had, you know, an old quote that jujitsu is perfect. It's humans that make the errors. And just, so by default, we will never reach perfect jujitsu because we're human. Um, but we should still strive to achieve that. So we should strive for jiu-jitsu to be gentle, but it's pretty rough. You know, those that train definitely know that. What about in that aspect of, like you were saying, like like it, it making you, in a way, a gentle person, like a, a, a humble person? Oh, in that way? Absolutely. Yes, in that way, absolutely. Um, and even when COVID first started, you know, um, when jiu-jitsu was taken away from me when I was, I was in training for a few months, you know, I was going crazy. I was running, I was running a lot. I was doing kettlebells. I was doing everything to, you know, to, you know, to stay busy to, you know, but I found myself getting, uh, irritable and I, I, I felt myself uh, being a different person than when I was training all the time. And later when I started to train again, um, I felt a lot better. And a lot of the people that, that I know said the same exact thing. You know, um, yes, you can, you know, sweat, you can find different avenues to get a workout, etc. But there's something that, that, that primal uh, energy from, you know, that you get from training that is, is, is impossible to, to replicate. Um, and that's what kind of makes you more gentle in a way. So for sure, I agree in that, with that. And do you think that's a, like an important thing to that like maybe people see in a way because I mean I think it's changing very quickly but there often was this idea of like you know martial arts makes you violent it, it, I mean even in France you know when I was there it was interesting that there's different laws if you did martial arts like if you injured someone and you were a martial arts practitioner it was a much harder mm -hmm. fine um, but and of course there's always exceptions like you were saying but 
it's from my observation like when people as you said do do jujitsu really well like searching for for like truth for deeper essence for that like that perfection almost inevitably they do emerge like more humble like more peaceful like you know, even on a on a very like practical point of view if you've been like getting beat up and you know sweating and practicing for six hours a day in a gym the last thing you want to do is like get in a fight in the street you know yeah. it's just that's out of your system yeah there's a and as you said, there, there's a real humility of, of like not when you understand like what fighting is and, and the, the harshness of it and the reality of it, you also don't want to fight someone because as mm -hmm. you said, like it, it, it can be very bad and we don't, no matter how good we are, we never 100% know how that's going to turn out. Yeah. Know the white, yet keep to the black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think, you know, also uh, the actual training itself, it's so physically draining that that in itself calms you down. That in itself makes you gentle. You're too tired to fight with your significant other over insignificant things, you know. I think a lot of arguments, you know, with our family and friends and loved ones, you know, happen because we have this energy that we didn't disperse in more positive ways. And then we just take it out on them for whatever for whatever reason. And you know, I think when you're too busy and when you're too tired, that in itself helps you, you know, be a better, you know, husband, a better partner, a better friend, a better, you know, family member, etc. So I think that's that's another another huge aspect of it. You you, you mentioned the, the the Tao a couple times, and and that's a that's a book that had a pretty profound uh, impact on my life. And for me, it also correlates very well to jiu-jitsu, like a lot of the things it speaks about in, in terms of polarity, in terms of flow, in terms of seeing things from a deeper level. Um, has that had an impact of like how you look at jiu-jitsu or look at life or like see the commonalities and things? Absolutely, 100%. You know, um, so the Dao De Jing, and you, you know, you, you sent me the copy of it. You know, I must have sent it to, you know, over 100 people, you know, since receiving it from you. And it's interesting, you know, the very first time that, that I read it, after you, after you had given it to me, I had like, a, like electricity going through my body. Like my whole body was tingling. And I'm a pretty unemotional person and this never really happened to me. So I really, really connected to it, right? Um, at the same time, you know, I don't really speak about it because, you know, you can't speak about it, right? That's what the text <laughs> says. So... You know, becomes interesting, right? But you know, the the word that comes to my mind when I think of Taoism is honesty. You know, this is a, you know a very important word, and you know, I'll give one example of jujitsu and how it can go against the Tao. So, like one uh, thing that annoys a lot of jujitsu practitioners is um, if, let's say, I'm rolling with you, and let's say I'm about to get the better of you, and I'm about to tap you out, you know, and I have you in a triangle choke, and you're like. Alex, uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, just uh, shift shift my arm across my neck, <laughs> you know, you do this, and then you coach me through, uh, you know, and all right, Alex, great job, awesome triangle choke, and you kind of take away that honesty from me, right, and, you know, everybody laughs about it, right, and I see even black belts doing this, right, and that's going against the Tao, so the person that just did this, they were not honest, right, they knew that they were about to tap out, so they chose a, a, an, an approach that would lesser the blows to their ego. So this is one example of many, right? So when you're training and when you're, you know, number one, getting better yourself, improving your technique, when you're helping out your classmates, when you're helping out junior students, in my opinion, this is the, the way, right? So this is the honest way. And when you're, you know, on this route, there are not too many arguments. There are not too many people being upset with you. You're not upset with yourself. Even if you tap out, you know, you come back to the next day and you try to fix that mistake. That's the search for the truth and that's the search for perfection. And that's following the route of the Tao, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that's super valuable. And, uh, you know, for me, the word truth really stands out. And like very similarly, like when we stand in our truth, as you said, that, there, that there's not a lot to... It becomes much harder to shake that foundation because there's no loose ends, you know. And as we start to go off center and to be dishonest or to all of the other things that can go along with that, mm -hmm. 
it becomes very difficult. We actually lose our center. We're, we're however we want to talk about it, our soul, our mind is, is in all of these places now because we've gone down all of these different paths. And yet to come back to center, there's there's something very strong in that because it's there's nothing to shake. It's this is who I am. This is what I yeah. said. Is it like even ideas of the word is so important? Like if I give my word, if it's unshakable, even if someone doesn't like it, it doesn't have the same impact because I'm honoring that word. But if I don't uphold that word, yeah. And even even in a lot of this plant work I do, there's there's often these ideas of like being susceptible to things, being susceptible to to darker energies or yeah. to, to attacks. To, I mean, because a lot of like shamanism or plant work, it's actually rooted in essentially martial arts, like warfare. Mm. And uh, but I found a lot of that is also from that thing of like coming away from truth. You know, if if I'm in integrity, if, if you're in integrity, if you say what you do, if you whether people agree with it or like it or not, they know this is Alex. And as long as you uphold that, there's nowhere for that to get in. Yeah. You know? But once I once I don't follow my word, or once I don't do what I say, or once I I'm not in integrity, or I cross a boundary that I said I wouldn't, then it's it's like it opens this door for all of these things to come in. One hundred percent. Yeah. And I think uh, like a lot before battle, a lot of warriors would use uh, plant medicine, right? So. You know, hype themselves up or calm themselves down, and to get ready. Is that right? To 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 some degree, the, I, I do know of some that did. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think in Scandinavia they did. Definitely mm-hmm. in the Amazon they did. I would imagine even I don't know this, but as you said, probably more often than not they did. Yeah. Even if it wasn't plants, it was some, I would imagine, yeah, or some ritual or some breath work, you know, prayer or something to to actually begin to to kind of calm the mind in a way, to allow, like, that flow to to be able to happen. Yeah. Which is something, I I mean, I have... You know, even some of the work we're doing now, we're beginning to work with like war veterans and stuff. Mm. And, you know, I have a tremendous respect for that because, uh, and I think a lot of that comes from martial arts, from plant work, you know, like having a tremendous respect for people who step into like these incredibly intense environments. Yeah. You know, jujitsu can, can put us in that plant work, you know, where you're literally potentially like life and death, you know, yeah. and, and warfare is that same thing. There, there's something very, and that's why I think it's strange for people to hear about that sometimes. Like they, they may be associated more with plant work, like mm-hmm. that life and death, that spirituality, but it's, it's extremely present in martial arts. And then you think about warfare, that's, yeah, you know, and there's, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, when the stakes are that high, it can be so easy to give in to all of the mind chatter, all of the, the physical sensations coming up, the, the the willingness to cross certain boundaries in the name of like personal safety, or and, mm-hmm. you know, as the stakes get higher, it becomes much more difficult, I think, to to follow that integrity. Yeah, and um, I do see some connections, right? I have some some close friends uh, who tell me about their experiences on mushrooms and other uh, like psychedelics and they tell me that there's something called the uh, ego death where you kind of you know your ego gets kind of killed and when they were explaining it to me you know I was you know laughing in my head because I was like man I'm getting ego death all the time when I tap out <laughs> like I'm a black belt and I just tapped out and I just made an error that I shouldn't make and you know that's my ego getting you know balanced out and it's you know making sure that it, it's it, it's not getting, getting too high and you know that back to what we talked about the humility aspect too so I, I think there's a lot of overlap uh, between you know really really hard training and honest training and you know some things that the plant medicine can offer from what I hear mm-hmm. yeah even in my work uh, I think at, at the end when, when people have really received something from, from plant spirit however someone wants to think about it there's always two qualities I see in someone that, that I know, like, they've done, like, really good work. 
and, and they've, they've fully gone into the experience. And, and those two qualities I see in them are, are humility and gratitude. And, uh, you know, that's also something I've seen in jiu-jitsu is like a real gratitude, like almost that like people experience having been given this gift. Yeah. Uh, which I think is really beautiful in jiu-jitsu too. I, I think a lot of places are losing it, but even, you know, a lot of like older school jiu-jitsu places, like you'd still see the photos of the lineage. And to yeah. me, that's something really beautiful. It's like... Like that was my teacher, and that that was his teacher. That's where mm -hmm. he got it from, and that's where he got it from. And you know, it's. I think there's something really beautiful in that, like honoring the people who came before us. Yep. You know, yep. Because I didn't create that. You didn't create it. You know, mm -hmm. we we were given a gift in a way, and, and and now we're able to hopefully you know pass that on, especially someone like in your position. And um, I mean, it, it also reminded me. He probably won't mind me saying this you remember Casey Casey Braxton mm -hmm. shout out to, to Casey <laughs> <laughs> but he said something to me and it, it's always stuck with me and it, I mean it was really powerful and he you know somehow we were talking about like like why Jiu Jitsu was good mm -hmm. and he said at that point in his life like it gave him a reason to get out of bed yeah you know and that was coming from like a deep place of gratitude yeah like gratitude to the art of Jiu Jitsu mm-hmm and that like always really stuck with me you know there's like for i think a lot of people who practice like it does it, like gives them a reason to actually be alive like their their life may be in a really difficult place and jujitsu in a way is like the saving grace like it it makes them feel good it gives them purpose it gives them community it gives them something to work towards there there's a sense of accomplishment there's a sense of humility and you know, all of these qualities that are, like, I think so fun fundamental to human beings, like that sport can actually, or that art can provide for them. Yeah. I mean, the other really interesting thing about jiu-jitsu is that it's, um, it's an individual sport. But um, a lot of individual sports, you are able to practice it on your own in one way or another. Uh, but not jiu-jitsu. You know, uh, you, you know, a lot of, you know, when COVID happened, a lot of my students were like, you know, oh, you know, what, how, what, how can I train on my own? And, and should I buy a grappling dummy? And what can I do on my own? And my answer was always, no, you can't, you know. And uh, that was the honest answer. You know, I told them that, you know, they would get, you know, more use out of watching jujitsu videos, keeping their mind sharp, out of doing yoga, out of doing calisthenics, kettlebells, whatever. And then, you know, trying to do like some random jujitsu solo drills and, you know, arm bars on a grappling dummy. Um, so you need those other bodies you need those other people to sacrifice themselves for you right because um a lot of times in jiu-jitsu um it's not going to be where um, both of us are equally benefiting from the training session um oftentimes one of us is gaining a little bit more than the other person right and like a common complaint or a question i hear is like oh man you know i'm a beginner and i'm just you know taking up this person's time you know and i'm just like you know they're purple belt and you know i feel so bad that they're you know taking you know all, all this time and helping me all the time and you know they're not getting anything out of it and there is some truth to that right that, you know that, that is true um however uh, at one point under that purple belt was also in their shoes and now this is their time to give back right so that's something that's really really beautiful about jiu-jitsu that that selfishness and that selflessness and the transaction between both, right? You need to a lot of oftentimes be selfish in the beginning and kind of take, take, take. And later when you've taken enough, it's time to give back, right? And I feel like the balance between the selfishness and the selflessness is the truth, right? And another issue that comes up in jiu-jitsu is people that are only selfish, right? They're just, you know, beating everybody up and not helping anybody, right? That's a, that's, that's a problem. Another problem is people that are too selfless, all they do is teach, you know, they have the good knowledge, but they don't really improve themselves. They're just trying to teach everybody every single day and they're, they're not eating themselves. So I think that having that balance is, is key and instrumental in any practitioners, whether they're a new student, a coach, whoever they are on their journey. Yeah, I remember, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably kind of a cliched saying, but it, that was something Shaolin said that, that always really stuck to me too, is that you know, you don't want to hurt your partner because if you hurt your partner, then you don't train jujitsu. Yeah, like you, you exactly. need your partner. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, and also this idea when you're talking about you know Jean Claude, like this idea of like a dance, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's something. It's an analogy I often use that I think people don't necessarily understand until they start doing jujitsu. But for me, I mean, it really is a dance. It's between a dance two bodies. Yeah, between two bodies. Yep. 
it's just the goal is different, you know, in salsa it's to, to turn someone or to, you know, throw them up in the air and jiu-jitsu it's you're, you're dancing but the goal is to choke them yeah you're dancing on. on their back before you <laughs> before you sink in the bow and arrow yeah <laughs> for sure yeah well cool man any we're, we're at about an hour and a half uh anything else you uh you want to talk about or anything that's on your mind uh i have so many i have so many things on my mind you know um i think uh you know I, I see I see some division in jiu-jitsu that's happening you know I see some you know even recently there's like a Brazilian jiu-jitsu versus American jiu-jitsu and you know gi versus no gi and you know a lot of teams are dividing in jiu-jitsu like um, if you look at you know different uh, you know players there's you know a lot of animosity and, and it, you know I feel like there's you know a lot of drama happening within jiu-jitsu and it's kind of fascinating because I'm not sure why it pertains to Brazilian jiu-jitsu more than others right and maybe it has to do with the history, right? Because even the reason we do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is because there was a legal battle on the name Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. You know, the Gracie family themselves had a legal battle over which of the Gracies can you technically use the term Gracie. And that's why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came to be, right? And, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but I think, you know, we can do better and we can, you know, have less drama, have less, you know, division as as a whole, and uh, you know, find ways to to, to use jujitsu as a vehicle for good. You know, can take a lot of kids off the streets. Uh, it could provide a lot of lonely people an outlet. Um, it can make you an amazing community. You know, the networking that you can find is like no other. Um, there doesn't need to be drama between teams. You know, and all this kind of stuff. I think you know, as martial artists, we should go a little bit deeper to our core. Right and um, right now, I feel like some of us are straying away from that, and I might I myself find find that I you know I'm guilty of that myself, and I always try to bring myself back to center. So, you know, I think that's you know that's super 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 important. And you know, otherwise, you know, I'm very grateful that I'm in this you know interesting period of of history where jujitsu is flourishing, and you know, I'm able to travel and to meet people, and you know, to to leave my mark. Um, you know, so I, I would like to finish with those words. And if um, if people are interested in learning more from you or, or working with you, what's uh, what's the the best way of doing that? Um, so you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is Alex Masterskaya. Uh, the word Masterskaya is a Russian word meaning workshop. You know, some people they think so. You you know now you're calling yourself master. You know, <laughs> when it, it has nothing to do with that. So Alex Masterskaya or my real last name is Eklan. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. Right, so uh, you can find my email. You know, I just I stopped giving out my phone number because I would get you know, f you know, phone calls and texts. You know, you know, twelve o'clock at night. You know, coach, how do I get out of the, the, that deli heel? You know, when they have the, the sleeve grip and not the collar grip. You know, and uh, you know, as important as that question is, you know, um, I think it's you know I can answer it just the next the following morning. You know, through a, a, a message or an email. So, um, but yeah, it's really easy to get a hold of me. Right, so. Or my website is just masterskaya.com. Mm -hmm. And any idea when the, the new studio may open? Um, so I've been, you know, I've been doing my best to reopen it, and it's been, you know, quite a struggle. So uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, you know. So as soon as the lease is signed, you know, we're pretty low budget, you know, low maintenance. We're going to throw some ads down and get back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully ASAP. Well, New York seems like it's coming back to life. I mean, who, you know, who knows what the future holds? But uh, even just walking around yesterday, there's there's a lot of people out here downtown. So, yeah, I, I hope that happens because it's it's pretty devastating what's happened. I mean, it's I mean, I'm almost surprised how many businesses were able to stay in business after yeah. such a long period of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, just for for the, the health and wellness of people the, the, as you said like that idea of like having community not being so lonely being able to have exercise it's it's also vital for human health and uh, for sure yeah so that, I feel like that's my way to give back you know if I if I had to redo it I would do wrestling you know in high school and maybe you know I'd become a doctor or you know find a different route such as the route that you're taking to help people but you know I'm actually pretty happy with you know I think you know I'm, you know, it's and it's selfish in a way too, but I'm, you know, since I love jujitsu so much, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to help and give back in that way, and more than just arm bars and chokes and the fastest way to sweep somebody, you know, a little bit deeper rooted in that. 
it's a beautiful art, man. And I, uh, I mean, even in the work I do, people probably get tired of it, but half of the analogies I use come from jujitsu. So, you know, it, it, it has a tremendous ability to, to teach us, to humble us, to give us gratitude, to make us better people, yeah. to, to teach us to be better men and women. Um, and you know, to, to be whole. And I think that's what all everyone's looking for. And, uh, I, I think it's it's a beautiful art, and and I think what you're doing is amazing. You Thank know, you so much. Uh, yeah, that's that's as high a path as anyone can take. Because jujitsu, it, it it really gives people that opportunity to to be better people, and that's that's a gift that you give to the world. Thank you. And a lot of respect to you, man. It just the the path you've taken and how you carry yourself. I, I think you really embody these ideals of. Of, of what a true, not only jiu-jitsu practitioner is, but like what it means to be like a true man and to stand in integrity, to, to live by what you say, to do good, to, to be gentle, to, to find that balance between strength and gentleness and and, and really to, to, to live what you preach, which I think is a, an increasingly rare thing in this time. And, and, and also a wisdom, you know, to, to see things from all sides, which... Uh, I think is really the the highest achievement anyone can have is to to approach life from that place of wisdom. Of, uh, so, man, I, I wish you the best, and and I hope I hope people reach out to you and and come back to the studio when it opens, and uh, and maybe in Christmas I'll I'll bring my rash guard and uh, nice. What about that purple belt? <laughs> <laughs> the vintage vintage yeah. purple belt. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have to bring that too. Maybe. Uh, Maybe get a half stripe or something on there at some point. <laughs> I got it. I got it for you. But yeah, thank you as well. You know, those that, you know, um, <clears throat> I keep saying I'm, I'm going to finish with this, but I guess I'll finish with this. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I'm an only child and um, I had one cousin and I was very close to my cousin and he passed away. And now I have no cousins. I have no siblings and my family is very small. And one of the things I'm very, very grateful for is a lot of the, you know, mostly older but you know older brothers and older mentor figures in my life you know some of them i mentioned you know uh, i even you know just gave it the shout outs to you know ivor tom cory there's countless others i don't want to you know name name you know everybody because i'm going to definitely miss somebody and then you know they're going to send me an email like alex you know i did all of this for you and i gave you all this advice <laughs> and number one you didn't take the advice and number two you didn't even give me a shout out on you know on the podcast uh, but definitely one of them is you and you know you're one you know one uh, person that i you know think the highest of and you know uh, you know oftentimes and you know it was interesting because there were some you know dark moments in my life uh where you know I'm, I'm down just like anybody else is down and you know although you and i don't communicate on a weekly basis you know you would reach out to me and it was a lot of times coincidental and you know just the, the, the talks with you and you know thinking about our interactions and some of the gifts that you've given me such as the Tao, um have been able to keep me going forward and keep you know help me keep pushing so you know big thanks to you and uh you know, I'm happy to see you succeeding and, you know, I'm happy to see, you know, you know, because a person like you in the Amazons can be anonymous, you know, but it's, you know, sharing your wisdom and sharing your knowledge is, you know, so beautiful and so many people are benefiting from it. And, you know, we're still able to use technology and things like that to, to reach this, uh, to reach more people. Yeah. Well, likewise, brother, maybe it's a similar Ukrainian roots, lack of emotion. A friendship with Yoga hunts. JJ. Yeah. <laughs> Could be all of those. That's yeah. right. He'll probably be tuning in. We can give him a shout out to Yoga JJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure, brother. I, I thank, thank you for you, doing man. this and I, I wish you all the best and uh, I, I look forward to, to continue and maybe at some point we do uh, part two. Let's do it. I'll see you yeah. Christmas. Yeah. You know? All right, brother. Thank you, brother. Yeah. And Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. That is it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with my friend Alex. Uh, I really enjoyed sitting down with him, catching up. Uh, it was really a pleasure for me. Um, as always, if you're able to support this show, that's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests, to continue to produce and, and make these episodes. Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can subscribe. There's different tiers you can sign up for, and it gives you back uh, some really nice benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And if you're able to do that uh, in advance, I thank you because that's a really big help. Um, also now with YouTube, there's the option to join the channel, uh, getting similar benefits, but instead of through Patreon, it's via YouTube. There should be a little join button uh, below the video. Um, if you're able to do that, uh, that's also 
also a, a really big help. Um, and then also there's the option of PayPal, and I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, simply subscribing to the show is a really big help. So the YouTube channel, subscribing, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, seems like a small thing, but that's a really big deal with the algorithms. And then uh, with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, uh, following the, the show or the channel, and uh, leaving a short starred rating and a review, that's also a really big help. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I'm still not sure the, the order of the following guests, but as always, I hope to continue to bring on some really fascinating people. So thank you all for tuning in, and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank you.